I'm sure your brains are all fried at the moment. I'd like to do a little fun exercise with you. Uh, I would like to share an ancient technique. It would be great if I could get your participation, actually. Uh, it's something I learned from a Mayan descendant that helps you, you know, greatly deal with levels of stress and anxiety. Now, if you could just um, follow this simple exercise with me, I'm sure you find it really fun. Okay, if you just hold your hands out like this, try to not invade the privacy of the person in front of you, right? <laughs> just hold your hands like that. Now I want you to put your hands together. Okay, now just slowly rub, right? Just, just rub it really, really lightly, okay? Now you're going to feel a warming sensation that's going to be coming out of this. I want you to focus on that energy right now. Just get it warm. Just get it really, really, really warm. Now, don't focus too much on the rubbing. Focus on that energy, right? Now this is a really important step. I want you to slowly move your hands apart like this. You feel that warmth? Now carefully place each hand on each eye like this. Now just hold it there while I finish my presentation because it really helped me <laughs> deal with my, my levels of stress and anxiety. Uh, uh, all right. My name is Mohamed Abdeen. I am an artist and a designer, and today I'll be talking about new beginnings. Luckily, however, I will not do, be doing this presentation alone. I've actually brought a very overly enthusiastic friend with me. <laughs> Uh, who will be assisting me with expressing my emotions while I deliver the content directly to you. Uh, please, let me introduce you to my chibi, Momo-chan. Right there, hello. Say hello. <laughs> all right, let's begin. It all begins somewhere, everything does. Our drive, our passion, usually stems out at a very young age and um, it either develops into something much greater or it transforms into something else completely different. For me, luckily, it began when I was a child. Things like video games, comic books, cartoons, art, and toys were my life. I remember uh, when, when I used to go to primary school, I used to live in Saudi at the time, and that was over a decade ago, and there was not much television going on. So I remember I used to wake up at five o'clock in the morning on a school day, and this was part of my routine. And my bus didn't come till 6.45, but I was up at five o'clock anyway. And that was just because I could get ready for school, sit down, and watch Captain Majid <laughs> just, just, before, just before I go to school. I, I also remember those days when I was in college, and I used to stay up till crazy o'clock playing these video games, you know, things like Final Fantasy, and there was a midterm the next morning, right? There was a midterm the next morning. That was just a few hours away. Or those times I used to rot in my room for 36 hours watching the most beautiful anime I have ever seen, you know? But then it became apparent to me, you know, I don't want it just to be a hobby, you know? I wanted more from it. I loved it. And because of that, I didn't want it to just, you know, be what it was, just a pastime. You know, I wanted to get involved. More so than getting involved, I wanted to create. You know, so for the past 12 years, I began, you know, I began drawing, I began creating comics, I began getting involved in the urban arts. And then all of a sudden, <clears throat> I had a simple idea. And my simple idea, I mean, this is a thought process, let me walk you through it at the time, three years ago, and this is obviously coupled with arrogance and lack of experience. So this is basically how it went. I wanted to create a do-it-yourself designer toy for the Middle East and provide artists in this region with a new creative platform and a mode of expression. And, you know, okay, what do I need to do that, right? I just need to find someone who will make it, share my drawings with that factory. They will produce it. They will deliver it on my doorstep. Everyone's happy. A happy ending. I have my toy. <laughs> but it wasn't that easy. It, re it really wasn't that easy. You see, what happened was, I began my journey and I started looking for some factories in China. I shortlisted a few of them and I finally decided which one I wanted to work with. But it's not as easy as just China, you know, it's always, oh, I make everything in China, you know. I, I, I shared a few emails with them uh, and, you know, we started talking, you know, they started laying out the plan, the process, the procedure and all that kind of stuff. But I can't believe I overlooked this fact. You know, sometimes you got to be old school. You know, sometimes an email cannot express what you want. You know, you got to pick up the phone and tell them, you'll be like, ni hao, you know, you got to call these guys, you know? And then when I called them, I started to realize, you know, I completely overlooked it. I can't believe I completely overlooked the fact that there was a language barrier. <laughs> so I started speaking to China, man. I started speaking to these guys. And it was complete gibberish in the beginning. I had no idea what these guys were saying. 
you know, and then slowly, slowly we started talking, and we began to talk some more, and we continued to talk, and we talked quite a lot. <laughs> but then these guys managed to actually lay the game down for me. You know, they told me, oh, this is what you need to do. You need to focus on these things. These are the kind of things we require from you. If you want to make a designer toy, this is what you need to do. So I said, okay. But they left out the most critical factors, the corresponding components to my production. I only know what this factory is doing. I don't know what else I need to do. I have no idea. Do you know how hard it is to ship stuff into this country through customs? <laughs> I, as an entrepreneur without a license, do you have any idea? And do you know how difficult it is to convince that guy at customs that 150 designer toys coming into Dubai by ship from a Chinese manufacturer based in the you know, industrial China was for personal use. <laughs> it was difficult. So it became apparent. This is the complex truth. You know, I started to see it. Things were not as easy as I thought they were, you know. So I had no idea about processes. Not a clue. I had no idea what this document was. What was that? Why are you sending me so many emails about things I have no idea about? I just want a toy. I had no idea what these guys wanted from me, right? So, so, so basically, you know, I, I started getting bombarded with all this sort of stuff. I'm like, you know, what, what is all this? What is this document? You need a what? Legal who? Who's this guy? I have no idea what's going on. You know, so, so it, at, at times it just got so frustrating, you know? It, got, it made me so angry because I had no idea what was going on. <laughs> it really was. I got so frustrated. So, so there, you know, I, there's all these, you know, I'm in the midst of these, mil, you know, I, I thought it couldn't be that hard. In the beginning, you know, after talking to China and stuff, you know, that's what I came in the game thinking it can't be that hard. Well, you know what? To come, come to think of it now, it actually isn't that hard. It's actually quite easy. You know, it's about as easy as making a Tesla coil, and that's how easy it is to make a designer toy. You know, it's not that easy. So there I am, confronted by a million things I had no idea about, right? So many, so many things, and my thought and my brainstorming process and all these bubbles and all these thoughts started to pop up, and I had no idea. Look at all these things I never even thought about. And it started to ruin my spirit, you know? It really did. But then I started to move on, you know? So what happened one day in the midst of this maelstrom is I received this letter, right? So I pick up the letter. I started to give it a read. You know, I started to think, oh, what's it all about? And I'll never forget what that letter wrote. You know, when I read it, and this is what it said. It said, welcome to the school of hard knocks. That's what that letter said. And that was then when everything was made apparent. You know, I'm enrolled, and I'm about to learn through life's most painful experiences. Right? <laughs> it's not easy, man, the school of hard knocks. You know, I'm currently involved. I'm enrolled. I'm in my third term. It's, it's not that easy. I wish, I wish I had some better facilities, you know? You know, after class, tuitions would be perfect. Maybe even a course outline or a schedule so you know the things that are to come in the future so you can prepare for them, you know? That would be great. That would be great. It really, it really would be. But, you know, going to the School of Hard Knocks, I also met a few people, you know, a few professors that I've learned greatly from today, and I'm still learning from them today. You know, Professor Common Sense and Professor Reality. I really am. They teach some pretty cool stuff. If you thought the global education system was messed up, just wait until you see these guys' unorthodox methods of teaching. I'm telling, I'm telling you right now, man, it's crazy. But I did pick up a few things. I did pick up a few lessons that they learned. And one of my favorites was, you know, how things are done and how things are actually done. <laughs> so I learned a few lessons, right? Now, I'm going to, you know, nip this one in the bud and I'll be straight with you. This is something you need to learn by yourself. No one will ever tell you this. And you can ask. You can ask until you're blue in the face. You might even get a few answers. But no one will actually tell you how things are done. You know, this is something you need to go out and venture out into the world and find out by yourself. I mean, or alternatively, you, you can always apply to the School of Hard Knocks. I believe it's a paperless process. I got a letter. I'm pretty sure you guys will get a letter, too. So besides all this stuff, you know, I'm hanging around the School of Hard Knocks, learning some pretty cool stuff with some cool professors. I also made a couple of cool friends. I really did, and they're pretty cool. I'm still friends with them till today. Best friends forever, you know. They always got my back. They're always there for me. The only problem is you can't get, you know, you can't get rid of them. These are my friends. 
And they're, and they're here to stay, man. These guys, you know, no matter what you do, you can't get rid of them. So let me tell you a funny story about stress and anxiety. I was, I just turned 21, and you know, I was pursuing my bachelor's. I was also working at the time, and I also was trying to, you know, launch my business. And my daily routine used to consist of me waking up at 7.30 in the morning, right, make it to work for 8.30. I used to work until three, get to university for four o'clock, and then from four, to eight, I was at uni and I was back home for nine, and from nine to about one or two in the morning, I was working on my business. And this trend seemed to you know, go on for the next year. And then I started feeling this really uncomfortable sensation in my chest, you know, this sort of acidic feeling. You know, and and uh, I, I, you know, being Superman, I ignored it you know, until I started feeling, I started feeling something weird in my heart. You know. It was this really weird feeling. So you know, on, on my daily routine to work, I didn't even leave the parking lot because the pain just got ridiculous. So I was like, oh, you know, it's four months, man. I've had this pain every single day. I might as well go to the doctor and check it out. So I called in the office and I said, hey, listen, I'm not making it in today. I'm just going to go straight to the hospital, man. I feel something really, really wrong with me. So that's what I did. I checked into the first hospital. I went inside, filled out the application, got to meet with a doctor, told him what was up, ECG, blood tests, all these other tests. And they made me wait for an hour. And that didn't really help my stress or anxiety. So I was there waiting for an hour, and then I get called into the doctor's office, and he told me, like, please sit down, and I sat down. I was like, what's up, man? He goes, Mo, you're perfectly healthy. I was like, what? I don't, I don't feel healthy. What are you talking about, man? My, my chest feels ridiculous. And he said, are you married? <laughs> I, and I started to laugh. I said, no, I'm not married. He goes, why are you stressed out, man? What are you so stressed out about? So, so I said, you know, I had a laugh with him, and I'm like, you know, I might as well leave with something. You know, this guy's not even telling me what's wrong with me. So I leaned over and asked for my blood type, because I never knew what my blood type was. And he, and he looked at me in the most cheesiest way, and he went, be positive. <clears throat> I, I had three things going through my mind at that point in time. I had three things going through my mind. So I have the cheesiest doctor in the world. Maybe he's right. Or maybe I should get a second opinion altogether. Either way, you know, now I've met some cool professors at the School of Hard Knocks, learned some cool lessons, met a couple of friends. But in the education system, you know, there are a few bad habits you pick up. You know, this is the flip side of it. And I tend to pick up a few of them. And what happened was I picked one and it's indefinitely been part of my daily routine. And I'm not proud of it, and that habit is the F word. <clears throat> I know, I know, I know, a taboo, right? I know, it's not welcome in most parts of the world, you know, definitely not in this region with, the, with this culture's rich customs, you know? But, you know, I'm sure every entrepreneur here or person has been through quite a few of these. You know, there's just no shortage of this word. You know, you can seem to pull it out from anywhere. You know, and, and most of us have been raised through life trying to, you know, don't do it. Try to avoid it. You know, I know I have used this word. I know I have. Profusely. I've used it quite a lot. But I'm here to tell you that it's not such a bad word. It really isn't. It's not a bad word. And you know, I'm just going to take a leap of faith here. I'm going to just go out and say it. Failure. It's not a bad word. It really isn't a bad word. I know a lot of us, you know, have been through a lot of failures in life. And a lot of people try to tell you to avoid it, you know. Just roll with the punches, you know, and, and don't. I'm here to tell you, don't avoid failure. You need to experience it. It's vital that you experience failure because through failure, you become smarter people, you become better people, you become better human beings. Now, a Chinese philosopher Confucius once said, our greatest glory is not in never failing, but in rising every time we fail. See, those phone calls with China did rub off a little bit. Right. So, you know, how do we feel when we fail? We feel uncomfortable. We feel discouraged. At the best of times, we feel shocked. At the worst of times, we feel defeated. <clears throat> now, it took me a while along my journey to figure this out. A lot of big mistakes, you know, a lot of wrong turns, a lot of wrong people I trusted, a lot of hopes, a lot of people let me down. But it's irrelevant. It really is. It doesn't really matter what I've been through. You know, what really matters is this. It all bottles down to this. 
the best catalyst for resilience is ambition. If you have ambition, this is the greatest power you will ever have. Don't get me wrong, the Green Lantern is quite cool as well, but, uh, but ambition is the greatest power you will ever have. It's that voice inside of you fighting for you. The more in tune you are with that voice, the more in tune you are with your true self. Now I know a few people here that have helped me along my journey and, and you guys have inspired me and my God, you guys work so hard and you guys are destined for great things to come in the future. And I just want to take this opportunity to thank you and salute you because you, my friends, truly know what ambition is all about. Now, <clears throat> I just want to leave you with a bit of philosophy that's gotten me through a lot of hard times in my life. And that's knowing the importance of being headstrong. The philosophy of the koi. I'm sure many of you are aware of what a koi is. If those of you who aren't aware of what a koi is, it's a fish illustrated here, also known as a carp. Now, according to Japanese folklore, there are two types of koi in this world. The first koi swims down the river. It swims with the current. It allows the river to take it wherever it may. And that fish is happy, it's healthy, and eventually will end up in a riverbank with other koi and will live his life and eventually one day die. The second type of koi, sorry, my bad. The second type of koi is the complete polar opposite. The second koi will swim against the river. It will swim against the will of the stream. And on this journey of sporadic change, that koi will be confronted by a series of waterfalls. And each waterfall that this koi fights and conquers, it will grow stronger. And it will continue to fight, and it will continue to persevere just to show its strength of purpose. It will continue to fight these waterfalls. And when it reaches that last waterfall, it will give it all it's got. It will fight till it's death. This koi will not give up. It will conquer that last waterfall. And through the mist of that last waterfall, that koi will emerge a dragon. Now I know all of us here have had our shares of waterfalls in life. And sometimes the best thing it seems to do is just go with the stream, go with the flow. But I'm here to tell you, don't. I'm here to tell you to persevere. I'm here to tell you to show your strength of purpose. You know, because, you know, be that koi like I'm trying to be. Because somewhere, you know, up that stream, up that river, we too can leave behind a legacy. We too can become dragons. And that's an idea that I thought that was worth sharing. Thank you very much. <laughs>